As a trauma survivor, I have always been interested in resilience. But growing up, I believed it was something that you were born with. Then in graduate school, I learned that it was a quality that we all possess and a set of skills we can all strengthen. Most of my resilience has come from writing and seeing myself in new ways by confronting the stories I've always told myself. The more I did that, the stronger I became, and I've dedicated my life to helping others do this work. This podcast is for anyone who wants to understand their story and how to revise it, because when we do that work, we change the world. Absence might make the heart grow fonder if we're referring to a long distance relationship between consenting adults, but sometimes absence is an ache you carry that influences how you see yourself and the world. That's especially true when the absent person in your life is your parent. If you're writing about this ache, how do you bring an absent parent to life yet keep them at bay? What if your first draft is a revenge tour of all the people who did you wrong? How would you go back and write about bad behavior while being fair and compassionate to your characters? Join me and Pushcart nominee, TEDx speaker, and multi-passionate creative Akamia Deadweiler as we talk about normalized violence, how our attachment styles can influence the way we approach our memoirs and the importance of connecting with your inner compass. During our conversation, you'll also learn what transcendental meditation is and how Akamia used her TM practice while writing her memoir, Daddy's Little Stranger, on this week's episode of the Writing and Resilience podcast. Let's dive in. Well, hello, Akamia. I am so glad that you are on the podcast today. Welcome to the Writing and Resilience podcast. I am happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to read your book, which I have right here, Daddy's Little Stranger. Mm-hmm. This book just it, it had so many heart punches in all of the good ways. And I just really resonated with this book. And I'm going to talk about what I liked about it in a minute. But I always like to give the author a chance to let us know what you would like us to know about your book. Mm. Well, that's, that's wonderful to hear. You know, you put something out into the world and it means something to you, but you're not always sure how it's going to land with others. So whenever I hear it resonated with someone, I'm, all, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I did a good job. <laughs> but to me, it means there is a lot of reflection and looking at parts of myself and parts of my life that I glossed over mm-hmm. historically, thinking that it didn't affect me when everything affects us in some way. Yeah fashion, you know, even if it's subconsciously or unconsciously. So it was just me going back and looking at the child version of myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because as as an adult, I feel pretty well adjusted, pretty well balanced, you know, in in aspects of my life, but we carry these children inside of us. Yeah these children often will make decisions for us and they think for us, you know, and we just kind of like go through like, oh, well, that's just how I am without really stopping to figure out why, why that is. So I wanted to go back and look at and kind of hold this child who had never been held, who informs me as an adult. And so I can kind of get her on my side and bring her to where I want us to be today. So that was the gist of it. Just looking at, you know, some things in childhood and what shaped me into the person I have become and kind of reconciling some, some issues and, and thoughts and beliefs that I'd never have looked at before. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that you talked about these child parts of us that run the show, because I can certainly (laughs) say that I have had that happen to me. And yeah, if we don't examine it, it does run us and it runs our decisions and our thinking and all kinds of things in ways that Mm -hmm. we don't anticipate. And I felt very connected with the child in this mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. I felt like you just rendered her so well. And she's such a strong yet vulnerable mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. You know, you were able to show both pieces. And for me personally, what I resonated with is this is a Rust Belt story. You know, mm-hmm. your story takes place in Gary, Indiana, but the idea of being from a place that had a specific history and story of, you know, wealth or prosperity and things going well. And then that huge economic decline and how those declines informs the story was, was meaningful to me because I grew up in Elmira, New York, Mm. which is a place in the 1980s 
that lost all of the jobs. And in fact, you know, the, the economic decline in that area was so steep that it made the New York times. Wow. Um, yeah. And the, the unemployment rate, I think at one point was it's over 9% and it's still that way. And what's interesting to me, looking back at the people that I grew up with who are wonderful people, they mm-hmm. carry that story. Yeah. And there's yeah. a story of it never getting better. Mm-hmm. of of mm-hmm. seeing yourself in a certain way because you're from a certain place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Someone was talking to me a little while ago about, well, what do we think needs to be done in Gary to revitalize it? We need to bring mm-hmm. jobs and X, Y, Z. And I kind of said what you said. It's like, once it's gone on for so long, mm-hmm yourself in this light and this becomes your normal and you've adapted to this new way of life like you said you the people carry them those stories with them so just bringing in jobs it will help but there's still a mentality that's developed yeah. in this area and that's that's the most difficult part I think to unravel and to rebuild because you grow accustomed to this way of life and this is the way things are here so now this is how I am and yes. just and jobs doesn't necessarily change with that change that you know mentality that you've been carrying for decades mm-hmm. so it's it's a difficult situation if it's not corrected you know kind of immediately and it goes on as long as you know this deterioration has gone on and it sounds like in in your hometown as well, once it's been going on for that long, it's really hard to unravel that because you have people now who have adapted to this new way of life for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think generations of people inheriting that mindset Mm -hmm. really impacts a place because what I can say in terms of the people I know where I'm from, there's a strong sense of we are people who can't get ahead The Mm -hmm. opportunities are not going to be there. Mm -hmm. Even if they say it's going to show up, it's not. So a lot of broken promises. So why should I try? And it's not that people are lazy or that they don't try, but it's that they don't believe always that their efforts are going to bear fruit. Exactly, exactly. And that's a huge part of it. You know, we like to write people off as lazy or criminals or this or that. Mm -hmm. But we don't stop to think what's informing that. Like you said, it's a mindset that's kind of like, this is how it is. And they don't see a way out of that. Mm -hmm. So if you develop this belief system that you like you said, no one cares about us, nothing's going to happen. They always say this is going to change and it isn't. I'm going to get it myself, figure it out myself. Yeah. Like that is a mindset that informs those behaviors. And it's not, like you said, just lazy. It's this belief that it doesn't matter, you know, that nothing you do, nothing that you do matters because this is how it is. And and this is how we are treated in the way that we have to learn to live. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things you, we've talked about by email, and I also saw it in your book is the concept of normalized violence Mm -hmm. and how we grow up in these places where violence is the norm, things are happening all around us. And when you live in those kinds of worlds, you become numb to the violence. It's just static in the background. And it's only when you extricate yourself from those situations that you can begin to connect with perhaps the fear that you lived with, the uncertainty, the sense of imbalance in terms of what's going to happen next. And I'm curious to know just your thoughts on normalized violence as a concept. And then we're going to dive into how you wrote your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's almost like you have to get out of the environment to really see that this isn't normal, like normal unquote, because it it was our normal, but yeah. you have to get out of that environment to see that this isn't the way it is, you know, everywhere. Mm-hmm. When you live there and you grow up there and you never leave and you never see anything else, you do, you believe this is how it is. And then whatever you're watching on television or film it kind of confirms that if you're watching, you know, similar stories about similar areas. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's in, it's not until you get out that you see like there there's more to the world and every place isn't like this, but it does stay ingrained in you. Um, I relocated to the West Coast uh, over a decade ago, 
But when I first moved here, I was still, I was noticing I was still carrying some of those mindsets. Like a perfect example, I bought a television for my apartment and I waited until like the middle of the night to take the box out to the garbage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because where I'm from, if someone knew that you bought something new, like your home was getting broken into and it was getting taken. So we yeah. learned, you know, we learned at home not to take electronic boxes out where people can see them. You have to do it at night when no one's watching so that no one knows you bought this thing. Or sometimes we would leave things in the car until the middle of the night and then go out and get them just so no one would even see us bringing it in. Mm -hmm. So that's an, that's an example of how that mindset kind of gets in, ingrained in you in this normalization of these, just these harmful thought patterns and this idea that bad, terrible things are always going to happen. Yeah. And the number of break-ins that mm -hmm. are mentioned in the book. Mm -hmm. And I, I vividly remember that moment where it's like, no, you, you open the packages in the middle of the night, you, you, right. you know, sneak them in your house. Mm -hmm. Also thinking that's really smart. Yeah. Um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> when you live in an area where those things are happening, I lived in an area like that where we, where there were a lot of break-ins. I mean, mm -hmm. one time I was sleeping in my living room and heard people trying to break into my house oh, and no, we would, <laughs> we, we nailed the, the, we actually nailed the window shut on the first floor because the, mm. the break-ins were happening so often, had so many things stolen from that place. Mm. Fortunately, didn't live there very long, but it was, it just became part of the norm that yeah. you can't, that you really can't have anything mm -hmm, right. because it's going to be taken away. Mm -hmm, exactly. Exactly. And like I said, it was very smart, but that's just an example of adapting to this mm -hmm. whole environment where you always just feel threatened and you always feel in, like you're in danger that something is going to be taken from you, as you said, and that mindset is ingrained in you. So even when I left and the threat was no longer there, I didn't know that it took me some time to see like, oh, this isn't going to happen here. Like, this is okay. Mm hmm yeah. And I think another thing that really helps depict that in your story is the boyfriends, like mm -hmm. not necessarily your mom's boyfriends. I mean, that's a whole other thing we're going to talk about, but you know, this narrator is a pretty innocent kid in certain ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there, or that she's shielded from some things. They're always there. That's not like she's completely shielded, but then she has these boyfriends Mm -hmm. And it's through the relationships she has and some of the small things that are revealed that we begin to see all of the things that are going on. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like these small little moments and these small details reveal huge things about her experience. And as you were thinking about writing this book and knowing that there was probably a lot of noise, a lot of issues or things that you could bring to the table that might give us a sense of what that world was like, but might take away from the story you want to tell. Mm -hmm. How did you decide which moments really mattered? Yeah, that was something I was thinking about. Like I could have told a million more stories than what mm -hmm. I did, in the book, but I really did try to find the ones that were relevant to the story and relevant to me. And in doing so, I tried to, like you said, I want, I don't want to just come out and tell you like, this is how it is. I'd rather mm -hmm. show you because my boyfriend did this, or he was in the paper for this, or this happened at the, you know, at the fast food restaurant I worked right. at, and let you come to those conclusions yourself about where I'm living and what we're exposed to and, and the way we are moving through the world on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had a lot more stories that were cut out just because they didn't fit with the larger flow of the book. Mm -hmm. One thing that felt like it was just inserted gratuitously, whereas like, why, why am I talking about this? Am I just doing this, you know, for shock value mm -hmm. or is there a greater purpose? If I had to question that or if it didn't feel like it fit into the flow of the story, I just cut it out because I didn't want to just be inserting things just to show you like, hey, look how, look how bad this is. Look how terrible this is. I wanted to always keep it in the context of my story and my experiences and what the child version of me experienced. So if it didn't directly relate to me and my story, 
somehow, I was likely to cut it. One of the few exceptions, and I wouldn't even say exceptions because it's still related to me, was talking about the shooting at the high school football Mm -hmm. game. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't there. So I didn't see it, but it affected me in a sense where it was what led to, you know, my friend's parents to take them out and put them in different schools. And that part affected me. Mm -hmm. I tried to anything I included, I tried to make sure that it uh, it related to me somehow and related to my story. And I wasn't telling other people's stories without, you know, reason. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, friendships play a huge role in this book. And that's one of the light and endearing pieces of this is that even though this is a story of fatherlessness, it's a story of abandonment. There were all these people who were there, not Mm -hmm. necessarily always the people you wanted to be there, AKA champ dad, (laughs) but, but that other people did step up to the plate. And so we had this balance, but yeah, I was really glad that you shared that shooting that happened because it gave me a sense of just this is the way things are in this community. And then there was another thing which you shared, and I'm not going to say what it is because I want people to read your book. But if you go to the very end, there are these moments where you're talking, and I I meant to flag that page, but I didn't, about things that happened in the family. And there was something that was described that happened to an aunt. And when I read it, it was such a vivid description that mm-hmm. I was like, oh, this tells me everything about mm-hmm. really how deep this goes. So sorry, guys, I'm not going to tell you what it is. But <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think that was a such, there were so many powerful moments that were small, but you kept the focus on what you were hoping to accomplish, which is really to explore this idea of fatherless daughters and how does this impact people? This is from page 152. You wrote, when you felt abandoned, especially in multiple ways by multiple people, some parts of you fears it will happen again. There are two options, live in the fear or avoid it, but it does not go away on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Those are your two options. It's there. It's ingrained into you the way everything else that you experience is. And it's like you either embrace it and say, I'm terrified, you know, that this person is going to leave me. And that can lead to a lot of obsessive compulsive behaviors. Are you here about just people hanging on to partners or you know, calling someone a hundred times because you're so afraid they're not going to come back or you just need to know what they are, you know, so you live in it or you avoid it, which is to say, I don't care. I don't need anyone. The fear is still there, but you're just avoiding the fact that it's still sitting inside of you by going extreme the other way and saying, I don't care, go home, stay, you know, go, I don't care either way. And that's kind of, that's an avoidance of it as opposed to facing it and dealing with it because it is still there regardless of which option you choose. Yeah. And you do a great job of talking about attachment style and how being abandoned, you know, by multiple parents, I mean, there's multiple father figures within the story that came and went. Some were, seemed like pretty good people. Others, definitely not so much. And we're going to talk about how do you portray those people in a little bit. But yeah, so that was going on. And I want to talk about the conversation you wanted to have around attachment style in this book. But before we get to that, some people might not know what attachment style means. So I just want to go over that very quickly. So your attachment style is the way that you connect with other people. And there are four main attachment styles. They're secure, which means you got everything that you needed and you're able to have good boundaries with other people. Avoidant, you push people away. You're keeping them away to avoid the pain of being abandoned again. Anxious, You do the opposite. You lean in and exactly what you're talking about. Call a million times. Are you okay? Are you, is everything fine? So a lot of leaning in versus leaning out. And then people who often have complex trauma might have what's called a disorganized attachment style, which is both a mixture of, you know, leaning in too much sometimes, and then pulling back because they're not certain which way to go. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
isn't it interesting like the various ways we can attach yes <laughs> yeah yeah secure attachment of course is the goal but it takes that having been your attachment style from the time that you were a child mm -hmm. to really develop that you know it's just if you weren't securely attached it's difficult to even know what that looks like you know or yeah. to know how that feels and securely attached as you said just means you know trusting people will show up for you because they always have trusting mm -hmm. them because you've always felt loved trusting that people will be there because they've always been there so like you said you've gotten everything that you needed so now as an adult you are securely attached but if you didn't have that you just illustrated there's a, n a number of ways that you can go in your adult life whereas you're even growing into an adult you know mm -hmm. how where you form friendships and relationships and all those things. So it's very interesting. I always say, like, if I could start over, I would probably go to school for a psychology because I'm just fascinated by human behavior and what shapes us into who we are and why we do the things we do. Yeah, I do think it's really fascinating. And for many people who have complex issues with attachment, whether it's avoidant or anxious or disorganized, it can be a very unconscious thing. It can be very automatic and it is capable to repair it. Mm -hmm. I mean, will you repair it in the same way as someone who, you know, was raised having secure attachment? Maybe mm -hmm. not, but there are a lot of repairs that can happen. And I'm mm -hmm. curious to know how did writing this book and really going back and exploring these issues help you both confront the attachment style that you have and maybe create some repairs around it. It forced me to sit with it. This book initially started as a collection of essays. So none of the stories were connected. It was kind of like I compartmentalized every story. This happened it's over next story, you know, <laughs> but when working with my publisher and editor, they were like, this should be a memoir. There is a cohesive thread. This mm -hmm. is a story. You can put it together because as you know, essays normally have a theme, but the yeah. stories aren't usually connected. Each story is its own, you know, thing. And they were like, no, we feel like this is a, a cohesive story. And so I went back and really had just had to break it apart and put it together as a cohesive story. And in doing that, it forced me to sit with it longer. You know, you write an essay, a few pages, 10 pages is done. We're on to mm -hmm. the next. But if I'm looking how to take this story and connect it throughout the book, I have to see, sit with yeah. everything longer than I would normally. And in sitting with it, I was start, I started to see patterns in myself. And I started to see that I have a behavioral uh, pattern and a way that I attach to people that is consistent, you know, for better or worse, it is consistent. And so I started realizing that I do have an attachment style. I just used to always write myself off as, you know, I don't attach to people easily. You know, I'm just not an emotional person. I don't attach easily. It's fine. But that in and of itself is an attachment style because I'm not... I'm not completely withdrawing, withdrawing from relationships. Mm -hmm. I am engaging in relationships. I'm just attaching, you know, in a, in a way that protected me in a sense, because I wouldn't get emotionally involved or emotionally immersed in relationships. So when it ended, I, I didn't really care. I didn't have skin in the game. And yeah. that in and of itself is an attachment style. And once I started to see that, like, this is a pattern that I've been repeating and the way that I've been attach attaching in relationships, because like I said, it's not like I wasn't participating in human relationships. Mm -hmm. I was, and I was just attaching in this very specific way that wasn't fair to the other person or to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I started to see that it's, I think all change starts with a conscious decision, especially when you're going against your human nature, when you're going against your natural disposition, it takes a conscious decision to behave this way and to do this thing that makes me mm. uncomfortable. And to call this person and say, I love you, even if I'm like squirming as I do it. Yeah. And I, when, once you make enough of those conscious decisions, it starts to become more and more comfortable. And then the goal is that eventually you'll get to a point where you don't have to think about it. It doesn't have to be a conscious decision mm -hmm. that becomes, 
you know, you rewire your brain in a sense and you rewire your behavioral patterns in a sense to where you've done it enough to where you're comfortable with it. And now it doesn't have to be conscious. It can become a makeup of how you interact with others in the world. Yeah, that is so beautifully said and so hard to do. <laughs> it because is. it's, I, I think one of the things I have squirmed with at various points of my life and along my healing journey is when you're having to examine patterns and realize that you are the one constant mm -hmm. in the midst of all these things that are happening. That's with, ev that's with everything. And, you know, not everyone wants to hear that, but if I feel like you're open to it, I'll say that. Like, if you keep experiencing the same things in relationships, mm -hmm. jobs, situations, or whatever, you have to look and say, what is the common denominator? I am the common denominator. So you, maybe I have to take a look at myself. It can't always be like the other person or the people around me. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing you said that's really interesting is that this book started out as an essay collection and then your publisher's like, uh-uh, that's <laughs> not it. It's got to be this other thing. And what's what I was thinking about when when you were talking about this is that, you know, for some people, breaking things apart and looking at separate pieces is an important part of the story and the storytelling. But when you're looking at certain kinds of attachment styles, especially we'll say the avoidant attachment style, mm -hmm. one story, one and done. Next mm -hmm. story, one and hey. done. There's a separation, right? And then, you know, if you have to write a cohesive story, you have to connect to it in a different way. And you have to find a way to connect and mm -hmm. pull it all together. Mm -hmm. There is. And that I never thought about it that way until you just said it. Like, even the way I wrote the story was avoidance, you know, avoiding attachment. It's like, I'm going to write this story, but I'm not going to get as, that close to it. You know, like you said, I'm going to write this essay and then I'm done. I'll write this other one and then I'm done. Like, and that's been the pattern, you know, of relationships that I experienced. But I never, I never connected the two until just now. But yeah, that's very true. Even the way I set out to write it was in my attachment style. Like, I don't want to stay with this too long. I want to do this and move on to something else. Isn't it fascinating the way we do that? It is, it is it's very fascinating. But yeah, that's exactly what it was. It was just, <sighs> part of it was me not believing that the stories were connected. Mm -hmm. And then part of it probably was, you know, subconscious me just not wanting to have to have to think about this for a long time, mm -hmm. the essay and be done with it. So I think it was a little bit of both, but definitely there was some avoidance there of really getting deep into these wounds and yeah. these hurt me that I never acknowledged or accepted mm -hmm. had hurt me. And I'm so glad that you took the time to do this because this book reads more like a novel you know, I felt myself getting immersed in the story, thinking about it when I wasn't reading it and mm -hmm. feeling like I had been taken into a world and, mm -hmm. and taken through a life. And I really enjoyed that aspect. I mean, there's other books that I like for other reasons, but I really loved that about your book. Mm -hmm. I love that you say that because we know, you know, novels are, they're known for storytelling. And that's why a lot of people will read fiction or read novels, even if they don't read nonfiction and they don't read memoirs is because of the storytelling aspect and you mm -hmm. can kind of do whatever you want to do in a novel to make the story interesting. So that was really, that was really important to me to make to my story into something that was also that could also engage a reader mm -hmm. as I'm writing a book. I'm not journaling. It's not just for me. It's for other people. So I wanted to tell the story in a way that would engage other people and make you want to continue reading this story about this person that you don't know, have yeah. never met, you know, <laughs> not a celebrity. And the way to do that, I know, is to create a story that, mm -hmm. that someone can get into. So I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, you have to make yourself into a character and a compelling character, which you absolutely do. And then you have to make everybody else a character in your story. And so how did you decide to handle some of what I'm going to call these bad dads? Because if you make them all bad, we're just going to be thinking, well, 
why in the world did you care about them anyway? I mean, these people are just terrible, like move on. Mm -hmm. But there was definitely some push and pull with some characters like Kareem is an exact is a character that I, I, I felt like you, you render him really well. And also in a way that felt very terrifying at times, rightly so. Mm -hmm. And, but then there's champ mm -hmm. and there's Terry mm -hmm. who I, I'm not going to put him in the bad dad care category, mm -hmm. but definitely not, but there's these other dads. So how did you go about thinking about what you were going to do with them? Mm -hmm. It took a while. That was probably the longest part of the reflection process for me. Mm -hmm. How, because it's become important to me to, and I think storytelling in general, is important to portray people as full characters. Yeah. Very rarely is someone all bad or all good. You know, we are full people and I wanted to put that onto the page and not just say, oh, this demon. Even like you said, for Kareem, he was probably the worst of the worst. But there was even a moment or two where, you know, I tried to show whatever his motivations were, is just this softer side of him, mm -hmm. so to speak. So it's important for me to make people full characters on the page because they are full characters and full people in, in real life. But it, it becomes difficult, especially with Champ, when this is someone I don't have much data on. Mm -hmm. I don't have any memories about. So I had to think like, how could I make him, you know, a, a more full character when the whole basis of the book is not having, you know, any material, you know? Yeah. So I just, that's where kind of the speculative aspect comes in, you know, and in the book, I mentioned how I found this article about him and I was just mm -hmm. kind of surprised like, wow, there he is. So I took that and kind of imagined a life for him. Mm -hmm. Of course, that I don't know if that's actually his life, but I could, I was able to garner a lot from this article that I found and it, it, it helped me imagine who he might have been aside from being my father. So I just looked for ways to do that because it became important to me too when I started writing memoirs and essays about my life. When I first started writing, it was more of a revenge tour, like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> the opposite of what we're saying it was a revenge to her, like you did this and I'm gonna tell everyone you did this mm -hmm. but I didn't like how that felt to me you know also I don't I don't know that readers nor necessarily like just someone being like you said railroaded and yeah. because it look at you like okay why are you why are you doing this to this person yeah. and you don't know what they were going through and well why were, are you still talking about these people if they were so terrible so I made this decision that I wanted to try to tell every story that I told from a place of love and empathy if mm -hmm. if I'm not close enough to them to really feel deep love just love in general and mm -hmm. a place a place of empathy and understanding that whoever whoever you are in my life or were in my life is a very small part of who you are as a person. And I don't think we always realize that, especially with parents, we tend to yeah. see ourselves as parents, not as humans, you know, mm -hmm. not as people in the world. And now realizing that they have an entire life outside of us and who they are to us is just one part of that life. And so acknowledging that and understanding that it was really important to me to try to find a way to make every character a full character mm -hmm. and in the sense that they weren't just whoever they were. They had more than just the role that they played in my life. Yeah. And I think you did that really well. And I think Champ was probably being the writing coach that I am and thinking about stories had to be the hardest one because what you had to accomplish was making him real and also keeping him absent because that was the whole purpose and I'm curious in terms of your healing process. And be before I ask the question, I'm just going to say, I'm glad you had the revenge tour. We all <laughs> need that draft. Like yeah, that's an important part of it. <laughs> yeah, you, you have to do that. And of course you realize, and that's not the final draft. And also you realize it didn't feel good. So it's mm -hmm. not just that it's not good for other people. It's not good for ourselves. But one of the ways that you kept Champ both absent and real is through the speculative piece. And what was that like for you to write something speculative about him and to connect with him in that way? 
It was a very visceral experience. And in doing that, that was probably the first time I was able to feel compassion mm -hmm. for him. And it was probably the first time I felt like, I don't know, maybe if he reached out to me, especially back then at the story that I found, maybe I would have, you know, run to help him or save him. Yeah. So the the speculation on the type of life that he may have been living or the type of life that he had, again, it, it helped me see him as more than just my biological father. It helped me see him as this person in the world who was struggling and had issues. And that allowed me to feel a sense of compassion for him. Yeah. And it became more than, oh, you, you know, you are a deadbeat or you abandoned me. Mm -hmm. And it became like, wow, this person had to have been suffering, which, yeah. which if you have any ounce of, you know, a heart inside of you, knowing someone is suffering makes you feel even, you know, a small bit of compassion, even if it's difficult to really, really feel for them. Yeah. But yeah, but looking at that was the first time the speculative, you know, aspect and envisioning where his life may have, may have taken him mm -hmm. and where have been how he may have been living was the first time that I was able to actually feel compassion for him and not just you know anger or bitterness over how he did how he did me in a sense yeah and what I would say for anyone that's listening if you are writing and you've already done the revenge tour you know writing a speculative scenes where you can imagine things in other ways whether they belong in your book or not can be such a powerful tool to help you develop the kind of compassion and broader sight that allows you to see what really belongs in your book, but also how you can round out your characters. Mm -hmm. But that's about story, you know, and there's the, all these different story tricks that we need to develop, but then there are things we have to do outside of ourselves. And one thing you mentioned in your book, which we were talking about before I hit the record button was transcendental meditation, which is something that is important to you. And mm -hmm. Can you tell us first what TM is? Because not everybody knows. And you can say that to the best of your ability. We know that you're not an expert in this, but just your experience of it. And then like, let's uh, dive into how that helped you do this writing work. Mm -hmm. Well, transcendental meditation is a very specific um, form of meditation that doesn't rely on breathing mm -hmm. or any of the techniques that you know we may be familiar with. You can do it anywhere. You can do it in the bed, you can do it on an airplane because it's, re it's just repeating a mantra over and over and over in your mind. And the point is the mantra, you don't know what the mantra means. It's just a, a phrase that they give you to repeat over and over in your mind. And what it does is give your mind just enough to focus on, to keep it from straying to thoughts and what's happening around you. But the fact that you don't know what it means, it doesn't give you so much that it requires like your, your concentration mm -hmm. or thought process to activate. So it's kind of just giving you something to focus on so that you can quiet your mind. And that's when the meditation actually happens. Yeah. So in quieting your mind and not having a story to build around what that word means or, or anything else that your mind could be distracted with, you begin to get into this meditative state that allows you to see things in a bigger way. And it's my understanding that most TM practitioners meditate twice a day for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the standard. That's the way I was taught. I've been doing it for so long now. If I'm being honest, I don't always do the two a day, but I always do the one in the morning. But you know, sometimes your day can just get away from mm -hmm. you and you won't find time to sit down in the evenings or the afternoon. But the proper technique is to do it for 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening. And that's all you need is that that 20 minutes, those two sessions of 20 minutes. In the very beginning, when I first started, I stuck to it religiously. You mm -hmm. know, it's when I woke up. 20 minutes when I came home from work and because it was so transformative and I was actually seeing results, I wanted to keep with it. It's just like anything else after you do it for so long. And I feel like I'm in a really good to where, like you said, the, the evening session doesn't always get in there, but I always do the morning session. And if I'm particularly struggling with something or having a rough time, mm -hmm. I'll reincorporate that second session. Like I'll find yes. just because it is so helpful. And I love that you talked about the gentleness with your practice that yes, there is like the quote unquote right way to do it. And yet there's reality. 
And (laughs) so many people will beat themselves up like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing it perfectly the way I was taught. And when Mm -hmm. we, we approach life that way, we're more likely to quit. But if you can just say like, all right, reality check, I got Mm -hmm. a lot going on. At least I got my morning session in. Yeah, yeah, we are. And actually part of what they teach you is to have, show yourself grace. Mm -hmm. Like that's important important part of meditation. If you're beating yourself up, you're just reinforcing all these negative thought processes that you've had that led you to want to learn to meditate or that negatively impacted your mental health. You're continuing that if you beat yourself up because you didn't get in the evening session that you didn't Mm -hmm. do this. And even with the meditation itself, like my practitioner taught me, we don't judge our meditation. Yeah. So even if I have a session where it's more difficult for me to quiet my mind and I am thinking a lot and I don't get the same feeling that I normally get. And then my 20 minutes is up and I don't really feel like, you know, the session was as rewarding as usual. I can't say that. Like you don't judge your meditation. Mm-hmm. You say I did it and it's done. And, you know, I, I showed up for myself today. Yeah. But, but even judging your meditation is counterproductive to the ability to meditate. I love that. And you did such a great way of describing that and the importance of being gentle with yourself. So how did both the way you approach TM and also your practice influence the way you approach some of these things in the book, like having to recognize sometimes you're the common denominator, dealing with these characters that were behaving badly, recognizing which of the many stories you could tell that actually belonged in your book. Mm -hmm. Well, recognizing that I am the common denominator, I am someone who accountability is my jam. I'm always looking for the ways that I can improve and that I can address the situation because I am the only person that I can control. And so I, I, I may be sort of in the minority in that sense that I have never shied away from accountability, especially in areas where I want to grow. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to grow. I wanted to feel better. I wanted to be a a more present partner and be able to emotionally attach to people. I wanted those things. So if it took me looking at myself and altering my behavior, I welcome that because I wanted, I wanted change in that area. I wanted to grow. And so if I, can have influence over that, that's even better because mm-hmm. I don't have to go back to these people in my book and ask them to, to change this for me or, be, or to be yeah. different so that I can be different. Actually knowing that I am the common denominator was empowering because mm-hmm. I can control me, you know, and I don't need other people to, to fix this for me. Yeah. And then as far as the characters and the way they are portrayed and things like that. I'm at the point where I operate where if if something doesn't feel good mm-hmm. to me, I'm probably not going to include it or I'm going to adjust it to the point where it does feel good. Because I think we are our own greatest compass. We are the, our yes. own indicator of the work we are doing. And you know, like your body and your heart and your mind knows when something isn't right. And if it's telling you this doesn't feel good and this isn't right, it's it's not, you know, your body isn't going to react that way if you're doing things in alignment with, you know, how you feel and how you want to portray yourself and others to the world. How do you connect with that inner compass? Because I think not everybody knows what it feels like. So what mm-hmm. does it feel like for you? For me, for me, I feel very, it's almost, I don't want to say it's like a sick feeling, but almost, you know, it's like I have this feeling in my stomach the same way when you know you've done something to hurt someone or, you know, you did the right thing and it just messes with you all night, you're up all night thinking, or even when someone has done something, treated you poorly, Mm -hmm. you're up all night thinking about it and you're just restless and feeling anxious. And that's what it feels like for me. And that's when I know like, this isn't going the way that I want it. Because you, of course, when you're writing stories of, you know, hurt and things that may have been traumatic, it's not always going to feel good. Like, Ooh, great story. You know, (laughs) you know, there may be times where you feel sad or you feel Mm -hmm. just 
down and things like that or you may have to step away because it's a little overwhelming so that's different from like that feeling in the pit of your stomach that intuition that tells you like something yes. is absolutely and it is such an important thing for all of us to cultivate both as just human beings and as writers mm -hmm. and i'm so glad that you had such a great publishing team and then editors that worked with you to help you figure this out as you also did this work. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, what is the best piece of writing advice that you've received? Hmm. I'm, I'm happy about that too, that you mentioned it. Cause now I think if that essay collection would have come out, it wouldn't have been as, it wouldn't have been as heartfelt. It wouldn't have been as full as the memoir. So I'm happy that they pushed me because I, I, I'm gonna, I'm not going to pretend I was immediately on board with that. I was right, like, of course, oh, I'll just work it. <laughs> but I'm happy they pushed me and were kind of adamant in a sense, like this really needs to be a memoir because I believe it turned out to be a far, far better, better book than it would have been as an essay collection. But the best piece of writing advice, which also helped inform me here in writing Daddy's Little Stranger, I got from Kwame Alexander. Yeah, the writer. Yeah. yeah. I went to a workshop. I got a scholarship to a Kwame Alexander memoir workshop because he- Oh my he gosh. Memoir, yeah. You know, he's mostly known for poetry and children's books, but he also wrote a memoir. And when he did, he held a memoir workshop. So going to that, I still remember to this day, and I always think about it. One of the pieces of advice he gave us was to write deep, not mm -hmm. wide. And I was like, wow, like that's it right there because we have a tendency to go into the room and you want to describe everything in the room and say what everything in the room meant to you. When if I go into the living room and the, and the story is about the couch, I want to tell you what color the couch is. How big is the couch? Mm -hmm. Does it have pillows? Um, how new is it? You know, how old is it? Where is it positioned? As opposed to coming in, the story is about the couch, but for some reason I'm telling you about the television and the lamp. So I would say write deep, not wide is, is the best piece of writing advice I've gotten this far. Nice. That is really good. And I could listen to Kwame Alexander anytime. He, he just always... I don't know. The cadence of his voice is, is so wonderful. Oh, yeah. And then also he just always says all of these wise things. I mean, I always feel like, wait a second, wait a second. I, where's my pencil? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. He's definitely, he's a phenomenal speaker, a phenomenal verbal yes. storyteller. That's something we talked about as well. Like the way he can captivate an audience mm -hmm. in telling a story, because that is a different skill, you know, from yes, it is writing a story, but I would say he definitely gave me a piece of writing that has stuck with me and will always stick with me, you know, write deep, not wide. I'm going to be thinking about that one for a while. It's such a beautiful one. So how yeah. do you care for yourself? I mean, you have your TM practice, but what is one thing you do to really cultivate your resilience? Mm -hmm. I abstain from overindulging in negative stimuli. Mm. Oh, and so that means if there's something particularly horrifying happening and it's all over social media, I probably will not get on social media that day mm. or get on after I see it again that day. Um, just because I don't, it's not helpful for me. Yeah. I don't know that it's helpful for anyone to be just continually bombarded mm -hmm. with negative things that are happening and, and videos and horrendous portrayals yeah. um, of people and events, but especially for me, it's important for me to limit negative stimuli so that mm -hmm. I, I don't watch the news and I limit my social media interactions and how often I get on there per day, because sometimes, you know, it can get really bad. And then that weighs, yeah. on, that weighs on you and your perspective of the world and how you feel about yourself. And you start to think, is this the world I want to be a part of? Right. when this is the world that we have. And also I understand having worked in media that media controls storylines. So yes. even just the fact that sometimes what we're seeing is not even always the full picture mm -hmm. and it has this negative impact on us. So that's a big thing that I do is limit, you know, my indulgence and in negative stimuli altogether. I would avoid it if I could, but I know that's not realistic and that's not feasible. And some, there are some things we need to be aware of, but yeah. I definitely, like limit my exposure to negative, negative stimuli so that it doesn't weigh on me because it mm -hmm. will. 
Absolutely. That's one of the things I really try to work on too. And I think for many trauma survivors that are listening, it is an important skill for you to cultivate because all of that negative stimuli just activates the parts of your nervous system that you're trying to heal. Mm -hmm. And what I really am trying to cultivate for myself is awareness so that I can engage through action. Mm -hmm. And many of those actions do not take place on social media. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So whether it's social media, whether it's people that provide negative stimuli consistently, yes. you know, we all may vent or complain here and there, but if it's people who are all, who, who just always have something negative to say or a negative story, um, I have to limit my interaction with those people. So it can be social media, it can be people, it can be the news, you know, anything that like you said, as a, as a trauma survivor, and once you started to heal and you want to continue that healing process, you can't dump salt in those wounds right. and expect them to heal. Absolutely. Well, I want everyone to buy your book because it is so good and I really, really enjoyed it. So if people want to buy Daddy's Little Stranger, I'm going to hold it up again because I love your cover. It's such a great <laughs> cover. It's so, so beautiful. What are the best ways for people to connect with you and also to buy your book? I am on Instagram. I know I just talked about avoiding social media, but I did. <laughs> Instagram is probably the place where I'm most active. And I'm on Instagram at Acamia. That's A-C-A-M-E-A. -A. You can buy my book at Bookshop, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I'm not going to police, you know, where you buy the book. I would just, you know, love for you to read it. And if you do, feel free to reach out to me. I also have a website, akamiadeadweiler.com, but you can order the book wherever you order books, Target, you know, Walmart, it's, it's available everywhere. And when you do order it, be sure to leave a five-star review and also to let libraries know that you'd like that book because whenever you do that, you not only support libraries and you support authors, you support people who need to read these stories but may not have the funds to do so. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Well, Akamia, it has been an absolute joy to have you on. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. I appreciate it. That's it for today's episode. If you'd like to learn more about Acamia and most importantly, buy a copy of Daddy's Little Stranger, please see the show notes for this episode. If you're learning from or enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's a free and easy way to support the podcast. You can also get the latest episodes delivered to your inbox by signing up for my Writing Your Resilience newsletter. As a thank you, you'll receive a free copy of A Trauma Survivor's Guide to Writing the Tough Stuff. You can also follow the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, where you can leave a five-star review. If you have questions for me, comments about the podcast, or questions or topics you'd like me to consider for the Writing Your Resilience podcast, please leave a comment on YouTube. I read them all, and I'd love to hear from you.